the topic of cities, the challenge of cities, is in some sense the great challenge of our age. Uh, what I've shown behind it is one way of thinking about the mass urbanization of the world. So each one of those bars shows the share of countries in each income group that is more than one-third urban. One-third is relatively arbitrary, but it's meant to convey a society that has become relatively connected in urban spaces. What you can see is that if I go back to, the, to 1960, and 1960 is shown by the blue lines, look at the between four and $5,000. In 1960, 80% of the countries with per capita incomes in modern dollars, between four and 5,000, were more than one-third urban. It's about the same amount today. Countries that are that rich were urban then and they are urban now. Uh, between three and 4,000, about the same. Uh, Brazil was actually between two and 3,000 then. So it would have been one of the countries that was more than one-third urbanized as of 1960, as of course Brazil became one-half urban in 1964, when its per capita income was just a bit over $2,000 in modern dollars. But the big change occurs in the poorest parts of the world. What share of countries with per capita incomes below $1,000 were more than one-third urban in 1960? It's a really easy number for all of you to remember. The number is zero, not a one. Because in 1960, as had been true throughout almost all of human history, to be poor was to be rural. Today, more than 40% of these poorest countries are more than one-third urban. We've seen mass urbanization in places that are unbelievably poor. You know, I was walking around Vijigal two days ago, and given the work that I've been doing in Africa, my first reaction was, my goodness, this place is rich. Uh, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a place that feels to me like Park Avenue relative to the, the impoverished areas of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and yet they are also urban. Today, uh, if you look to one to 2,000, in 1960, 20% of those countries were more than one-third urban. Today, 60% are more than one-third urban. And so you have mass urbanization in places that are both poor and often poorly governed. One of the points, in fact, the main point of this talk is that the challenges of dealing with this urbanization is in some sense, it may be the most important task of the 21st century. And it is a task at which Brazilians are ideally positioned because this country experienced urbanization when it was still reasonably poor. And consequently, when Africa looks for guidance for how to urbanize in the 21st century, it should not be looking north to London, which went through these experiences 200 years ago. Right? It should be looking instead to the west. It should be looking to Brazil. Now, I often think about cities as being characterized by a triad of three things. The first leg of that triad shown up, up there, which is a marketplace in, in old Jerusalem, is the magic of social interactions in cities. It's the fact that we can trade in cities. It's the fact that we can work together in cities. It's the fact that in urban areas, in dense urban areas, as the English economist Alfred Marshall wrote more than 100 years ago, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. The fact that we learn so much from people who are close to us. And that is not being changed by new technologies at all. Right? The more complicated the world is, the easier it is for ideas to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard thing about teaching is not knowing your subject material, it's knowing whether anything you're saying is getting through. And face-to-face -face contact, that contact that is enabled by cities, helps to make that happen, helps to enable us to learn from one another. The second part of this triad, and you see down here, this is an image of Boston after the bombing at the marathon, is, are the demons that come with density. When two people are close enough to exchange an idea face to face, they're also close enough to give each other a contagious disease. And if someone is close enough to sell you a magazine, they're close enough to rob you. And for thousands of years, cities have been trying to battle the demons that come with density. And this requires a robust public sector. A robust public sector combined with NGOs, with non-governmental organizations, to actually manage the public commons, to manage interactions between people in a way that eliminates it from being harmful. The third leg of this triad is the physical city. It's the built environment, which when people think of city skylines, they sometimes think that the buildings are all the city on. They are not. 
and the buildings ultimately always exist to be in service to the people that use them. But of course, those buildings are crucial. Those buildings actually enable the cities to function, and the infrastructure is, is absolutely vital as well. Now, I'm not going to be talking about the economic magic of cities very much in this, in this talk. I've talked a lot about them. I've written a lot about it over the last quarter century and more. Um, I'll just say a couple of things, one of which is whatever we are tempted to give up seeing the awful things that can happen in the cities that are the poorest parts of the world, we have to remember that there is no path out of poverty into prosperity that does not run through city streets. What you're seeing here is urbanization in 1960 along the x-axis and per capita growth between 1960 and 2010 along the y-axis. I am not saying here, this graph does not imply that we should force people into the cities at all. But you cannot look at this graph and think the right answer is to stop people from coming to cities. Right? Cities are deeply associated with the process of economic development. When you compare those countries in the world that are more than one third, one half urbanized, to those countries that are less than one half urbanized, the more urbanized countries have incomes that are on average five times higher, five times higher, and infant mortality levels that are less than one third the less urbanized countries. This is also true within countries. So this is from a recent paper of mine comparing the US, uh, Brazil, India, and China. This is the relationship between the size of agglomeration and incomes. If anything, the link between urbanization and income is stronger in India, China, and Brazil and than it is the US. I will say one other thing because it is, a, it is an important theme. It's not one that I will stress throughout the rest of the talk. But the great determinant of urban success in all of these countries is education. Education is the bedrock on which urban growth lasts. It, it determines how prosperous the city is. It determines how fast it grows in terms of income and population. And this is, if anything, far more true in the developing world than it is in the United States. Now, cities are often seen as being places where you can get rich but also places that destroy quality of life, that destroy the human spirit itself. Certainly people like Gandhi, who famously regarded the growth of cities as an evil thing, bad for mankind and the world, would have probably accepted the point that cities are associated with wealth, but claimed that cities do other terrible things, which, which uh, more than offset those advantages. That's not what the data says. When we look at self-reported life satisfaction, how happy people are with their lives, when we look at this in the wealthy world, we see no difference. And what you're seeing here is income along the horizontal, and along the vertical is the difference in self-reported happiness between urban and rural areas. So zero means it's exactly the same. People in the country and people in the city say they're equally happy. Down here, people in the country say they're happier. Up here, people say in cities say that they're happier. Now what you see is in the wealthy world, there's basically no difference between city and country in, in this. Um, you know, some places like Sweden favors the urbanites. Some places like New Zealand favors the, the rural dwellers. But when you go to the poorest parts of the world, particularly, somewhat ironically, above all India, happiness strongly favors urban living, which does not tell you that, again, we should not be pushing people out of farms into cities. But you cannot look at data like this and think that Gandhi was right, that we should somehow or other stop, if we ever could and we can't, the urbanization of, of India. Um, this is a place where there is a future. And a mistake that we often make, that Westerners, that the wealthy often make when they go to an Indian slum, is they see the lies and they think how horrible that is, and that they, these things, places shouldn't exist. But they're comparing it to their own life. And no one in that slum had the option of going back to New York City and living in there in a duplex or whatever it is, right? They have the option of living in rural poverty in India or living in rural poverty in the northeast of Brazil. And for them, living in a peri-urban area in Sao Paulo beat that, right? It was better than that. And we should in some sense respect that, at the same time fighting to make those areas more livable, more humane, better places of opportunity. Now, as we switch our focus, and, and there's in some sense a knowledge mismatch, just say a little bit about the academic literatures that are part of this. There are two literatures in economics that deal with developing world cities. One of which is development economics, the other of which is urban economics. Both of them have a mismatch. Development economics has been overwhelmingly focused on farms and how to make farms more productive. That is a good thing to be focused on, but it is overwhelmingly the past, not the future. 
Okay? Urban economics is overwhelmingly focused on the wealthy world. Right? That is also not where the action is in cities. The most exciting things in cities are happening in the developing world, not in the relatively static cities of Europe and the US. Now, because urban economics grew up in, um, in the wealthy West, we're used to having data handed to us by government agencies. This is not the world of Sub-Saharan Africa. We do not have this access. Right? And so we have to find alternative sources of data, cell phone records, right? financial transactions from commercial entities like Zona, and I'll come back to this in a second, or even, in some cases, Google Street View. And the first part of what I'm going to be talking about, and pretty much everything that I'm going to be talking about here is from relatively recent research. The, the paper that I'm going to be talking about actually came out this week in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, and so it really is it's hot off the presses. Um, so consequently, some of my visuals would be less elegant than if I'd been doing it for five years. Um, but we now have Google Street View. We don't actually have it in Africa. We do have it in much of India. We do have it in much of, much of Latin America. And what Google Street View enables us to do is to start quantifying the physical appearance of an area. Now this has value if you're interested in architecture, if you're interested in aesthetics. It has value if you're trying to figure out how much housing prices are. If you're trying to run a tax assessment business. So if you're Pakistan and you're trying to implement property taxes, but you don't trust your tax assessors to do it without being bribed. Using visual imagery to then form an algorithm that predicts prices can ev evade this, can elude this. Um, or let's say you just want to measure wealth and poverty. Maybe the images will let us measure wealth and poverty. So I'm going to talk to you about this agenda, which is about using the images to measure urban areas. Um, now, we have Google Street View in some parts of the world from 2007 onward. And we're getting more every day. And there are other providers in India. There are other street level providers that exist to do this. Africa remains the big outlier. And of course, China, I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, I, I will talk a little bit about China towards the end of the talk. And in some sense, the hope is you have, this is in Dhaka, you have areas where you have no measurement of wealth and poverty. You have no measurement, perhaps, of you know, where, there are, where there are open sewers, where there are other health problems. The images can help us now measure that. Let's, let's talk about how this works. So um, the start of this, this visual agenda starts with, uh, really, uh, Cesar Hidalgo. Uh, and uh, my co-author, Cesar Hidalgo is also my co-author, but Nikhil Naik, and in papers that I actually didn't have that much about, that, that much to do with, which started with just crowdsourcing what a streetscape looks like. So let me show you what this is. So this is, again, I had nothing to do with this original research, but it is where the research that I am going to present, it is my co-author, starts with. So there was something called Place Pulse, and they in invited people online to look at two images and say which one looks safer. They also asked which one looks more beautiful, which one looks more pleasant. Um, it turns out safer, more beautiful, more pleasant, people basically answered the same things. There, there, was, there weren't a lot of difference in, you know, we think we'd be able to you know, aesthetically distinguish between these things. When you ask people, you get the same thing. Basically, they like one streetscape more than the other. So using 4,000 images from New York, Boston, Linz, and Salzburg, do not possibly ask me why Linz and Salzburg were seen as being the two natural global cities to act in this mix. Uh, and they got you know, 8,000 people to just go online and for free they go, oh, I like this street, I like this street, I like this street, I like, like this street. Okay? So they start with this database. Then with this, you can then feed this into an algorithm. So it's basically like you have a whole bunch of these pairs, and it's like they're playing in a chess tournament. Each streetscape, in some sense, played a chess game with another, another streetscape, and you see who wins. So there are well-developed algorithms. We used Microsoft, they used Microsoft Street, True Skill, and I wasn't part of this, right? To um, figure out what's the applied rank of quality predicted by how many wins you got. In the same sense that if you have a series of chess games, right, played by various masters, you can then use an algorithm like this to say who's really the best of these, these guys and so forth. It's exactly the same process. So with that, they then form, so this is a, this is a particular loser, okay? This is, this is not a place that people feel safe in. Uh, this is, these are all pretty low, it goes up to 10, so this is a particular loser. This is getting slightly better. Uh, and these are high streetscapes, so these are places that people said looked, looked better. Okay, so they got, you know, 8,000 images or so ranked in this. But you can see what the challenge is. So for New York City, which has one million street blocks, using this you know, bespoke individual ranking, they were able to get to 1,700 street blocks, right? Very limited in your ability to come to scale, very limited in your ability to actually get, get anywhere. So this 
is where Nikhil Naik came in. So this was Cesare Hidalgo doing this thing. Nikhil was a graduate student, he's a computer scientist at MIT. And he said, you know, Cesare, I'm an expert in visual recognition software. I can take this data and then form a computer program that looks at this, quantifies the images, so it takes out first the sky building ground trees, gets a bunch of stuff that I really don't understand, so don't push me very much on it. Uh, and uh, these histograms, these texton maps, and then you predict, using machine learning, you predict the, the street score. So with that, starting with these 8,000 images as training data, you create an algorithm that can do the million plots based on the 1700. And all of a sudden, amazing things open up, right? All of a sudden, if the algorithm works, and it does work reasonably well, you can explain about 60% of the variation with, it, with the algorithm, um, you can look at everything. You can go back in time, and you can do any number of things with this. Now, the possibilities that are created by this machine learning means that it's not just that you can predict street score. You can predict income. You can predict is there standing water. You can do all sorts of things with these images once you combine them with the machine learning. The whole world of an urban streetscape becomes something that we can now quantify, that we can actually do data science on. So with that, starting with these small number of things, we have all this, right? The green means people think it looked safe. The brown means people think it didn't look safe. So this is New York. Uh, the, this, this thing is um, you know, Central Park, of course. Um, this is Detroit. This is Boston. This is Chicago. They did it for seven cities. I should actually say right now that, that you know, there are lots of different ways of checking the algorithm. Most of them show that it does quite well. The one thing it does not do quite well on is actually predicting street crime. Okay, so places that look unsafe are not places where people get robbed a lot. I think you should be able to figure out why. Just go back to this image. So think about why there aren't a lot of robberies here. Who's going to hang out there? Who's going to go there and say, oh boy, this is where I want to hang out. Go ahead and rob me in this dangerous place. So, you know, it actually doesn't, uh, and you can actually look at things like Yelp reviews and so forth and tweets and actually show that people don't actually go to these places that look, that look unsafe. So what predicts street, uh, high streets for? What predicts high things? Well, it turns out population density. So where people live, people feel safe. Um, education is, again, a very big predictor. Lots of families, very big predictor. Um, at older areas, people feel safer in. Actually, we thought that having more African Americans would be associated with feeling less safe. It's not true in this data. It isn't a negative. There, there isn't a negative correlation there. Uh, there is a negative. Co there is uh, a negative correlation with um, poverty, though. Now, where I can't come in is, and this is the paper that came out this week, is that using this to quantify neighborhood dynamics. So what we can now do is say, we've measured changes in neighborhood income for many years, but we've never really been able to quantify changes in the streetscape. How is this area, has it gotten nicer, has it gotten uglier? What predicts which areas upgrade their physical landscape, become more attractive or, or look safer to people? So here we can use the same algorithm. This is exactly the same street, okay? This is 2007, and it got a whopping score of 1.8 out of 10, which no one thought it was a great idea to, to hang out there. Uh, and now it's up to 7.2. People think that it's a, lot, it's a lot safer. And we can then quantify these changes. Now, computing over urban change does require a bunch of sort of sophisticated things in terms of visual recognition stuff. Um, there are problems in terms of, and you can just think about this, there are problems in terms of occlusion, right? So um, this is, you know, um, these things are blocking the stuff. So by and large, these things we screen out. We try and get rid of the areas in which they're occlusion. There are, there are issues with trees. And trees are sort of more, less clear that you want to, want to get rid of them. Overexposure is a problem. This one I particularly like, and this is completely random that they included this image in this. This was my favorite place for getting hot dogs when I was 15 years old. It was Grace, Grace Papaya. Um, so, but you handle these technical things. And then you have a map, and this is actually Brooklyn, showing population density, share college education. Gated. This is street score in 2007, and this is the growth in street score. Now you can see visually, look at where the educated people live here, and look at where street scores changed. Okay? It was the educated parts of Brooklyn that upgraded, that gentrified. And they didn't just gentrify in income, they gentrified in the actual physical landscape in a way that we can actually physically measure right now. Now, it turns out we can do this across a bunch of cities using a statistical, you know, using normal statistical techniques. The same two variables, education and density, that predict the level of street score, predict the growth of street score. The places that started with more people became, looked safer. 
Uh, the places with initial levels of population density, the effect is weaker, but they also look better. And it's also more weakly true that the places that started with a higher street score saw more growth. And this is in some sense related to the tipping theory of Grodzins and Schelling. So you'll remember going back to Schelling from the 1960s to Grodzins in the 1950s, I hypothesis that ugly neighborhoods or neighborhoods with lower income people or neighborhoods with minorities uh, were thought, according to this, this hypothesis, that they would get worse over time, whereas neighborhoods that were good would get better over time. Now, the cities in our sample actually were all getting better over time. This was a, a time in which cities are you know, doing well in the US. But you can see pretty clearly that the places that started with higher street score had the most street score growth. That in fact, it does very much support the idea that, that places with an initial advantage had and stuff, which is one interpretation of the tipping hypothesis. Um, we also found it, it, support for one of the oldest hypotheses of urban change, which goes back to the Chicago School of Sociology 100 years ago, where Burgess hypothesized that there was something called invasion, that places that were near to unattractive, industrial, low-income areas would get worse. Places that were near to downtown or near to attractive places would get better. And this is exactly what you see. So distance to CBD means being close to the, uh, being far away from the downtown area. The places, the negative coefficient means those areas that were close to the CBD had the biggest improvements in street score. Those places that were farther away, farthest away had the least. This says places that were, had a high street score close by, they did better. Places that had a low street score nearby, they did worse. Having being surrounded by higher population density, again, positive and more educated people, not just in your area, but nearby, were associated with this physical upgrading of the neighborhood. So, I think this at least shows something that you can do with this, this visual imagery in terms of measuring change. Now, what else can you do? And I'm an economist. Measuring perceived safety was not what I thought my job was, although it's, it's certainly interesting to, to see this. What else can we do with this? So the most practical thing you can do with this is predicting property values. So there are different reasons why you might think about this. If you were just an ordinary consumer of housing, you might want to say, here's what my house looks like. Tell me what it's worth. Right? So you know, that's one thing. Even more interestingly is, is you think you're in some area and you want to have a property tax system on which you're going to base local revenues, but you don't want to pay for some huge army of tax assessors to go around and value it. To what extent can a computer image-based property algorithm duplicate what assessors do? So in this case, we've done this for Boston. We still are working on the draft of it, but pretty, pretty nearly done. So we start with a bunch of images. And just to remind you what housing in Boston looks like, this is what housing in Boston looks like. Okay, this is what ordinary housing looks like. There's a lot of this stuff. We have, uh, in our data set, we have about 50,000 single family homes in our data set that are sold over a 30 year period. We also have all the data from the property tax assessors. So we all have all the army of humans who the city of Boston sends out and says, check here, what's here, what's here, what's here, what's here, okay? And they check, it, they check it down. And of course, we have street score measures and we have all the images. So, uh, I'm sorry about this again, this is, the, the cost of having new day, new research rather than having old research is it's, is it's all in this totally unusable form or, or visually usable. Um, here in this case, I'm comparing how well, if you just use, use the assessor's variables versus using the images and street score. So we're doing with street score, just let's go back to this for one second. Exactly, we're taking this, we're doing exactly what we did for the, the street score. We predict street score on the pixels. Here we take the property value and we predict the property value with the pixels. So we do the same sort of vision algorithm and we say, tell us how well you can fit this price by using the colors and the shapes and the various parts of it. And the answer is, using the assessor's variables, you can explain about 13% of the variation in price. Using the, the images, you can explain 16% of the variation on price. This is over and above what you can explain by neighborhood. So, so it's, it's an added bonus. Doing the both, you get to 18%. Um, if you do add in a bunch of other basic variables, you get to 25% with the assessor and 23% with the basic plus imagery. The point is that you do almost, if you just use the, the street view, you do better than the assessor. If you add in the basic variables, you do almost as well. Okay? Which is not to say that you're, you can explain all of this property valuation at all, but as well as you can do with a human being who goes and checks the list, you can do with an image from the street. Okay? Which, tells you that particularly in a, in a corruption in a weak institutional environment, that this may be a far better method than actually hiring a bunch of people who can be potentially bribed by the people who own the homes. The frontier of this is Zillow. So Zillow images 
give us not just the exterior images, but the interior images as well. So that also adds to our ability to predict, predict prices uh, through the use of the visual images. Now, the last visualization thing that I want to talk about is um, about measuring income in the developing world. So there are whole parts of the developing world where we don't know what's rich and what's poor. Put in a new highway or a new road, you don't know if it got richer, you don't know if it got poor. So what if you could measure income or poverty by looking at the streetscape? What if the streetscape gave you enough information to figure out whether or not this area was rich or poor? Did it get richer or did it get poor? Um, so we did this first for New York and Boston. So again, the process here is you start with a bunch of images of the blocks. We know, which is why this is kind of useless in the US, we know the income of these blocks in the US, so we don't actually need to do this, so we're just testing whether or not it's doable. Um, so we feed this income in. <coughs> Using these computer vision techniques, we essentially fit the income with the pixels, and then we get a predicted income algorithm. Okay, how well does it fit? For New York, it fits unbelievably well. Now, in the case of these pixel-driven models, there's always a thread of what's called overfitting, meaning that you have so many potential explanatory variables, you always want to sort of be very careful about that. So what you always do is you take a training sample that you train your model on, and then you keep a testing sample pure, and you ask, how well does the model do in this testing sample that it hasn't been directly fitted to? The answer is it can explain 80% of the variation in the testing samples in the New York. So what appears to me is that the images on the street New York City blocks, unbelievably good job of predicting whether or not rich people or poor people live inside those buildings. Right? But that that ends up doing unbelievably well. And indeed, when we take the New York train model, so the New York train model to Boston, it does even better in Boston. Right? So in the US, income is particularly in these cities. Right? So I, I haven't done this for Houston. I don't know. I can't make the same thing that that would be true. But in New York and Boston, the image from the street tells you the income behind the, the facade. Now, what about a developing world country? We started with this in Jakarta. Jakarta, you know, we did peri-urban Jakarta. It turned out just getting, just making sure the address went to the right house was so impossible that we had to give up on Jakarta. So we said Jakarta was too far. We went, we went too far to Jakarta. Let's stop in Chile, okay? Where the data is pretty good, the the the, uh, the addresses are pretty good, and it's it's a lot poorer than New York. Uh, the answer is we didn't do nearly as well. So in the testing sample, we got to an R squared of 30%. Now, 30% isn't nothing, but it sure as heck isn't this magical 80% that we got to New York. So that means we can explain three tenths of the variation in income across Chilean blocks. And let me show you why I think why. I think it says something deep about the demand for aesthetics and the demand to show off your income. So I'm just going to show you a couple of images. So this area is Las Condes in Santiago de Chile. Uh, this is rich. You look at this and you, you say in the context of a middle income country like Chile, this is obviously a relatively wealthy area. It's well kept up, it's, it's green. And the street view can pick this up. The algorithm can pick this up. But move to middle income versus lower income. These are just two random, random pictures, these two. I don't know that I would know looking at this that this area is poorer than this area. And the more that I pulled, the more I wasn't surprised that Google Street View couldn't pick it up. So let me throw out a hypothesis that potentially makes this makes this clear, and is that there is a level of income in which people are so poor that you have, that their houses are really falling apart. And you can actually pick that up from the street in Chile. So the very poorest tenth, you know them. Right? The houses are in disrepair. The, the infrastructure is un, unfinished. Then there's the richest fifth of Chile. And they're rich enough that they're sort of in the wealthy world where they're, they're kind of showing off. They actually want stuff that looks like, looks like this rather than that looks like this. But for a vast middle of the Chilean population earning, I don't know, five to ten thousand dollars a year or something, something like that. That group, they want to make sure their house is safe, but they're not in the business of showing off. Right? And consequently, picking income from the street from that group seems to be very hard. And this may be particular to Chile, I don't know, but it does suggest that this this technology may not be perfect for fitting middle income people. It also maybe tells us something about how much people value the exterior what the exterior looks like versus not. And I haven't even raised the issue of potentially people wanting the house not to look too nice because of safety issues, which is obviously a, another reason why you wouldn't really want to advertise that you were that you were rich. In fact, a very clear prediction is that as rule of law gets better, people should be more willing to try and use income to show off their wealth. And that, that's something that we hope to test in the, in the years ahead. OK. A um, couple more things. So still staying with the built environment. Now, moving off from the visual recognition Stuff, and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about policy in the developing world. 
When I think about the built environment, I think that there is two twin dragons, Scylla and Charybdis, that you know, countries fall into when it comes to the physical environment. One of which is NIMBYism, not in my backyardism, excess zoning, excess regulations, excess historic preservation, saying no to everything. This is particularly an Anglo-Saxon curse, okay? But it shows up in lots of different ways as well. I mean, and it's it's something very much we feel in the in the U.S. Right, particularly coasts, not necessarily in Texas. It's very common in, in London. Uh, uh, but you know, it becomes tragic when India decides to imitate the British Town and Country Planning Act of 1948. Now, the idea that any town and country planning regulations that are appropriate for Yorkshire in 1950 would be appropriate for Mumbai is insane, right? It's absolutely insane to think that you're going to imitate British town and country planning in, in a country as poor as India at the same time here. What you have is that Mumbai, one of the you know, mega cities of the world, a place that has desperately cries out for more physical space, more good structures, has labored under some of the most draconian land use restrictions for 50 years. Four area ratio maxima in central Mumbai, typically averaged about one and a quarter stories. So you could build to one and a quarter stories. And this was partially abetted by city planners, by city leaders who wanted to stop the growth of Mumbai. So I began with this view that it was you know, a terrible mistake to think we wanted to start, stop the growth of the cities. One of the reasons it's a mistake is when you, when you try to do it, you often adopt very counterproductive policies like this. So consequently, instead of building up, the Mumbai sprawls out. Right? Commutes are horrendous, of course. Hundreds of people die relating to commuting every year. And it's a city in which there's no possibility for the sort of dense, high-rise living that would enable pedestrians to get, get towards one another. This is one curse. There's another curse, though. And I've chosen a place in which it's pretty safe to make fun of, uh, which is Astana in Kazakhstan, uh, which is filled with monuments to the, the leadership. Right? And this is the other mistake that is made. It's building for the sake of building rather than for the humanity that inhabits that building, sort of large structures for the sake of large structures. Now, Astana is not the most important case of this. Uh, the case in which I think there's far more socially costly monumentalism is China. And I I'm just going to show you a couple of things about a recent paper of mine that just came out in the Journal of Economic Perspectives on the Chinese housing boom over the last 15 years, just to, just to wet your appetite. It's important to think about both NIMBYism and monumentalism at the same time. Now, this is the US. This is over the past 20 years. The, the, along the horizontal axis is distance to the city center. Along the vertical axis is growth in housing prices. And what you see is that really all of the big growth in housing prices is at the city center. That reflects two things. This switch in demand for proximity to the urban core. Right? The fact that in 1970 people were running away from cities, and in 2010 they're running back for all of the joys and pleasures that we get from being close to one another in, in urban areas. But also, it's about the difficulty of building. It's about the fact that out here, you can actually build new homes, and in here you can. Right? And it's when robust demand collides against fixed supply that we see prices go through the roof. Now, one of the consequences of American opposition to growth, which is not evenly spread, is that we build in the wrong places. A sensible building policy would add density, would add new structures in the places of America that are most productive, right? the coastal cities, the places that are actually greenest, which are also the coastal cities, particularly California. But no, they don't, because those are the areas that are most hostile to building. Instead, where do we add new housing? Perfectly good places, but places that have certainly much lower incomes, like Houston, Texas, like Dallas, Texas, like Atlanta. I mean, you don't understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, and Phoenix each add a million people between 2000 and 2010 without understanding that they make it very easy to build mass-produced affordable housing. You may not necessarily want to live in those places, but you cannot deny that they do an extraordinary job of providing affordable housing to middle-income Americans, and they do it by unleashing private development. Now, I thought this was just an American thing. I thought this was just what happened when you had NIMBYism that was particularly centered in productive places. This is the exact same graph for China. This is not NIMBYism. This is monumentalism. This is the fact that the leadership of China's regions are judged on what they do to GDP. And either you get GDP by having real economics, or you know how else you can get GDP? You just build a lot. Okay? You build a lot whether or not anyone wants it or not. You build a lot to add to your, your GDP. And you don't have to sell it even. 
You're just measuring GDP at the value that you say that it is. So you can goose your GDP if you're a local leader just by building a lot. And consequently, of course, it's the leaders who are the lowest income areas who have the strongest incentive to do this. It's also true that you get local revenues by taking land and selling it. So if you don't have alternative sources for revenues, this is what you do. Now what this means is that we have been through this explosive Chinese boom. And what I'm doing here is this shows prices. The three lines show the tiers of Chinese cities. First tier cities are the biggest, the famous ones, uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. Uh, the orange lines are second tier cities, still places that are enormous, 10 million people in them. The third tier are the slightly smaller ones. I, I've shown you the American cities. I've tried to make comparable tiers along here. Now, the American cities are during the time of the American boom. So the years are 1996 to 2006 for America. The Chinese years are 2003 to 2013. So they're not the same years, they're both, but they're both meant to capture during the boom, where they're roughly comparable. So America experienced this huge boom, right? We, we, I lived through it. I thought it was this amazing thing, absolutely extraordinary, all these prices going through the roof. It's nothing relative to what's happening in China, right? The price changes are minuscule relative to the, you know, the doubling of prices in the best, in the top American cities are dwarfed by the five-fold <laughs> increase over 10 years of prices in, in China. Now, of course, China's experienced income growth that is unlike America's. Right? It, is, it is a far more dynamic economy in many ways. So maybe this isn't surprising, but there are reasons why we should be worried. These are the same two time periods again, 96 to 2006 for the US, 2003 to 2013. This is the amount of dollar value of construction. So this is US building over the boom. This is Chinese building over the boom. Again, right, vastly more construction in China. One of the, one of the sort of amazing things that, we, that we've seen. And China does need to urbanize. It's not obvious that this is wrong. But I think when you look more closely, it's often the wrong type of building, the wrong level of quality, in the wrong place, at the wrong time. Okay? And one of the reasons we see this is the massive growth of empty buildings. And you can go to a second or particularly a third tier city, and you wander through these forests of empty skyscrapers. On one level, they are spectacular monuments to Chinese engineering. On the other level, they're a sign that something is badly wrong. Now, the reason why there are empty skyscrapers is actually two, two different reasons why there's emptiness. One of which is there are developers who have built them and have not sold them. And the reason why they're not selling them is that if they sold them, they would have to sell them at a loss. And unlike in, I assume it's in Brazil, it's the same as the US, if you're a developer who's borrowed money and you're sitting on a lot of empty building, the, the bank will make you sell the buildings, right? They're gonna make you get your cash out. That's not how it works in China, right? Your bank is a public bank, it's a government-owned bank, and the bank does not want some collapse in housing prices. So the bank says, sure, we'll grant you forbearance. You can hold on to these things for a while. And so this is the kind of increase in billions of square feet. So just divide by 10 for billions of square meters. So this is a, a growth of, a, of a, you know, a 10 billion, a, 10, a 1 billion square meter empty inventory sitting on developers' books. Okay? Notice I've done it by tiers. None of this is in the first tier cities. This is not a Shanghai, Shenzhen, Beijing problem. It's a problem in the second, third, and fourth tier cities. Now, the other thing that's going on, and which is less of a problem, is the growth of empty buildings that are bought by investors who just buy and hold empty houses. And that's really interesting from a US perspective because we had lots of investment buying in the boom as well. But if you're an investor in the US, you bought it and you rented it, right? Because you were trying to get some of your money back. They don't rent it. They buy it and they hold it and it's empty. And that's what I mean by saying it's built at the wrong time. If you're going to buy an apartment, if you're going to build an apartment and then you're going to set empty for a decade, you shouldn't have built it then. You should wait 10 years before someone's actually willing to, to use it. And yet this is what, what this cocktail of incentives has created. Now, together with my co-authors, we've tried to simulate, given various predictions about income and supply growth, about what's going to happen to prices over the next 20 years, assuming that China becomes something of an ordinary country in terms of housing demand. And along this axis is predicted is different measures for income growth. So if you think income growth is going to be 10% per year, you're up here. If you think it's 5%, it's here. If you think it's zero, you're down here. And along here is how much the growth in new construction is going to be. And the dotted line will be what the construction has been over the past. So basically, this line is the 3% annual return threshold. So to get there, you need either monumental amounts of income growth right, or a lot of shutdown of prices, of, of new supply. Given anything else, you're sort of stuck. And, and the point being that China's basically got a, got a quandary. China and Chinese leaders have the ability to do something about this, but it's not clear what the right answer is. They can either continue to build as they currently have, in which case it is almost impossible to imagine a situation in which prices will not fall. Or they can radically cut back on the amount of new supply, in which case prices can stay robust, 
but you know they will shut down urbanization, they will cause massive construction employment, and that is a that is a point. I will say one last thing that's actually really important when you think about housing bubbles in general. Um, the, the, the 250 years of housing bubbles and real estate bubbles in the US teach us one thing, which is it's very hard to predict what demand will be. But when you know something about supply, when you know how much it costs to build and produce a home, and when prices go way beyond that level of supply, then the bus is predictable. So I had no idea whether or not housing was overpriced on Park Avenue in New York in 2006. It's like a Park Avenue apartment, like a Belgravia house. It's like a Rembrandt. They're not making them anymore. So who knows what, what you know, people are willing to pay for it. But a, a, a house outside of Las Vegas, there's no restrictions on land. There are no regulatory barriers. It costs you know, $800 a square meter to build. Right? And it builds as much as you want. When prices are suddenly $2,000 a square meter, $3,000 a square meter for the house, you know there's something wrong. And I mean, that's exactly what happens, the predictable bust. And that's, when you think about housing bubbles, stay focused on the supply side. Stay focused on how easy it is to deliver the product. And that's exactly the same we should think about China, right? The future of these prices is not about predicting income as much as thinking about what's gonna to happen to the supply of units. Last point I wanna make, and this in some sense is where some of the most important issues are. Uh, if, if I were giving this at, at uh, uh, Water Futura instead of Arc Futura, I would have led with I would have led with this. But uh, the, um, the 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 demons of density, the difficulty of actually uh, dealing with people who live close to one another. The most important of those demons is contagious disease. And for centuries, the cities of the West had to deal with the fact that we kill each other by living close to one another. Right? Unless we have decent infrastructure, unless we have clean water, unless we have sewerage. Boy born in New York City in 1900 could expect to live seven years less than the national average. That was roughly the same number as in Shakespeare's London. New York did not become safe by accident. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the national government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. But infrastructure was required, but it was never enough. And as we think about the cities of the developing world, it is important never to think that it's just about engineering. Engineering is one part of this, this story. But simultaneously, there's a need for incentives and institutions. And you can see that right off this graph. So when I was a child, and these are death rates over the past 200 years. When I was a child, I was raised on a story of engineering triumphalism. That New York was filthy, and then the great engineers came and built an aqueduct, the Croton Aqueduct, which brought in the clean waters from upstate, and all of a sudden, New Yorkers could drink cleanly and they stopped dying. Now, how do you know this is a lie? Croton Aqueduct was opened here in 1842, right there, okay? For 25 years after the Croton Aqueduct was opened, New Yorkers continued to die of cholera epidemics. My great, 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 great grandfather died in the 1849 New York cholera epidemic, seven years after this, and it would have been a surprise to him, as he lay on his deathbed, to learn that the Croton Aqueduct had solved all of New York's problems. Um, why? Why did New Yorkers continue to die for 25 years after the aqueduct? The same reasons Africans continue to get cholera. Right? Because of, even when the Millennium Development Cabin has built a nice water main into their city, because of the last mile problem. Because we build a water main and we then expect the poor people to then pay for the connections. And, you know, a connection is $1,000 in Zambia, and poor people's income averages $1,500 per capita. And they say, this doesn't sound like a very good deal to me. I'm not going to spend $1,000 for your connection which means we've spent tens of millions of dollars for the water main, and we don't get the connection. There are only two ways of dealing with this that I know of, one of which is to subsidize it, which is incredibly expensive and will artificially induce people to come to cities, and the other way, which is painful to contemplate, but it was how New York did it, is to penalize property owners who don't connect. So in 1866, and that's when you start seeing the decline, which is when the Board of Health was born, was started, you started having legal penalties, financial penalties, for tenement owners who did not connect to the water, who did not connect to the sewers. You had to have rules to actually make sure that people took care of their city. And that's a running point. And it reminds us that you know, cities depend upon the rule of law to actually make people take actions that protect their neighbors. Now, this creates a whole host of problems when you don't trust the police. New York handled this by having an alternative inspection service that was answerable to doctors. Um, it creates alternative, even worse problems when you don't know who owns the land. So one of the things, New York may have been poor in 1866, and it may have been corrupt as heck, as it, should, it certainly was, but you certainly knew who owned every property in New York City. 
tried doing this in a peri-urban area in Sao Paulo or a peri-urban area in Africa. And it reminds us that property ownership, the case for property ownership, is not just the Hernando de Soto point about empowering the poor. It's also about being able to impose obligations on property owners so that they actually take care of their own, their own land. Um, this is Zambia is where I do some work. So this is the kind of water facilities we're looking at in Zambia. And in Zambia, what we've been looking at, I'll just say a little bit about this, the, the, we often talk about, in terms of the achievement, just getting water connections. So even when you solve the water, the last mile problem, you've got the water connection, it's still not enough. Why? Because the water goes out all the time. In Zambia, you never have water after 5 p.m. That's a, that's, a, that's a given. But the water goes out constantly. And together with Nava Ashraf, Bryce Steinberg, and Abe Holland, we've measured what happens to households when the water goes out. Okay? So again, you have to accept the idea that, the, that it's not random that one area gets more water outages than another, but it's kind of random that one area got a water outage on January 3rd, and the other area got a water outage on April 6th. So you have to accept that that's random to think that this is a valid experiment. If you do accept that, I'll tell you that not only do you, of course, see more cases in local clinics of diarrhea, various forms, and typhoid fever, both of them, which are waterborne diseases, which are probably not surprising because they switch when they don't have the, the water from the pipes to less clean alternatives. But you also see more respiratory illnesses. Why? What do you wash your hands with? Right? So if you don't wash your hands, if you don't clean yourself, you also, you also get sick. You even see, seem to have a little bit more measles, which is perhaps even more uh, surprising, which may be a weakening of the immune system from other areas. We also find that there's less economic transactions from these financial transactions that go on, on through these, these booths. And we see that the girls spend less time doing their homework when the water goes out. And it's because the girls are the ones who are sent to get the water from somewhere else. Okay, so they end up doing more and more chores. Uh, point about institutions. Where do the water, water break? So it turns out that the water company in San Diego is paid in two ways. One of which is by meter, meaning per square, per cubic meter of water that you sold, they get more money. The second of which is households pay a fixed monthly fee. What we see in the data is the more meters, right, the more quickly problems are resolved, and the fewer the, the days of, of problems are. Okay? And it's a very clear story of incentives. The water company has a real incentive to make sure the water is flowing when they get to charge for it, where it's a fixed fee, they don't care. So they don't fix the water so it doesn't flow. And it reminds us that the institutions, the way that we pay for things, are you know, crucial for actually solving some of these problems. We think holistically about how to fix these institutions and make them better. Two last points. Uh, one of which is cholera today is not what it was 150 years ago. Cholera actually didn't even require antibiotics. Uh, it just requires the proper use of hydration therapy to actually stop people from dying, dying from it. Um, but there are other diseases, some of which are waterborne, that we solve with antibiotics. So in general, we die of far fewer infectious diseases. But, but, what if, by choosing in developing world cities like Hyderabad in India, which is where this is from, by choosing to deal with infectious disease, to deal with these water problems, not by providing decent water infrastructure, but instead by giving people lots and lots of antibiotics. Remember, this is India. This is the capital of you know, antibiotics that are freely available at low prices everywhere. What if we are breeding antibiotic-resistant you know, hyperkiller bacteria? So together with a uh, former student of mine, who's now a doctor at Stanford Medical School, and David Cutler, we've been looking at the presence of antibiotic disease resistance in, uh, across mothers in Hyderabad. Now, the crucial element here is these women came in to be examined, not because they were sick, but because they were mothers. They came in there, so it's, it's sort of like a census of them, rather than saying, where did, where did we see sick people come in, which is, a, which is a problem if you use that, because it, you know, wealthier people tend to come in more than poorer people do. So we did this. We used the same visual tools that we did before to see who lived near open water and who didn't, right? Who had water pits around. And what you see is the prevalence of this antibiotic resistant disease, so this is just distance water, the places that were far away from water, there was none of it. It was all in the places that were close to water, which suggests that the choice of dealing with these diseases, not by fixing the water supply, but by just giving people pills, we may end up all paying for so it, it reminds us that actually dealing with these cities is a challenge for everyone in the 21st century. Last point I want to make, and then, then I want to end on this. Um, it is, of course, tempting uh, to look at the problems of developing world cities, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and just think these are intractable and we're going to give up, and it's never going to work. 
I think one of the reasons to be hopeful is that cities aren't just about economics. They're not just about fun. They're not just about transportation. They're not just about disease. They're also about, at least I think, they're also about political change. I think there's a reasonable view that the road from dictatorship to democracy also runs through city streets. We have good statistical evidence suggesting that dictatorships are more likely to be rebelled against the more urbanized the societies. Now, it's less clear that urbanization always leads to stable democracy. So the urban crowds in Tahrir Square certainly didn't help topple the dictatorial regime. It's less clear that we think that they've replaced it with a strong democracy. But I think the hope is that the civil society created in cities doesn't just serve to create economic productivity, but it enables a well-functioning society that will then discipline its leaders, that will then create a stronger democracy, that will then lead to a better city overall. I think that's ultimately what, what we're fighting for. So I'm going to stop there and hand it over to my distinguished my distinguished discussants. But again, thank you for your time.